My name is Skip Rutherford, and I'm Dean of the school, and we're uh, honored to have you today uh, on this beautiful day, and thank you all for being here. To introduce our speaker this morning uh, is one of our colleagues, uh, and also the resident doctor here at the Clinton School. Gary Whitter is one of our students. He's certainly one of the outstanding pediatricians at Arkansas Children's Hospital. I served on the Children's Hospital Board uh, with Dr. Pfizer, and Gary's work here is, is, is well known and well respected. But you will be seeing shortly is a report that UAMS, the Children's Hospital, Clinton School, and others have released on the state of children's health in Arkansas. It is a compelling, um, somewhat disheartening, challenging report about the first comprehensive review of children's health in a long time in all areas. And Gary was one of the editors uh, and uh, the producers of, the, of that report. It's, it's going to get a widespread play when it is released. Uh, he'll be going to release this summer as part of his international public service project. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Gary. successes. 
one of the most important activities she was involved in as a faculty member at UAMS was her work with the Women's Caucus at UAMS. She initiated this program, which is 10, 15 years old now, and she started it. And I think it's a great example for uh, young people in whatever study where they need professional guidance. She essentially started the program there, and the outcome has been remarkable. She has been an incredible mentor to my younger uh, junior women colleagues in our department, and they have become far more successful than the men have. Uh, <laughs> uh, most of the young women that Debbie brought into the program have been very successful with their NI, their NIH grants, uh, federal funding, and other things, uh, and, and really have
activities for others would include those for your spouse, your children, and maybe parents or other family members, your friends, and then of course service to the community. Many years ago, I interviewed for a job over dinner with my prospective employer and his wife, and the wife commented, I just don't know what's wrong with the young girls these days. They think they can do it all, like have a family and work too. Well, you know, my heart sank at that point. Um, and, but I told her something at that point that I still believe very strongly. Uh, and I think she is right that no one can do it all. But you can do more than one thing. And some people can handle three or five priorities. Some who are really very well organized and efficient can handle 10 or 12. Um, and the point is it's necessary to consider each of these facets of work and self and others and establish your own list of your most important so that nothing is just squeezed out by default. And that's the thing we want to avoid, is just letting something fall by the wayside because we haven't figured out the fact that it is important and we want to include it. So I, I really believe that happiness comes from feeling as though you're effectively tending to those things that are most important to you as a person. Now there's been a lot written about the four generations who are working side by side in the workplace today. Each of those generations has been both praised and criticized for various characteristics. But one comment that surfaces frequently is that the young people of today are choosing their careers with lifestyle and work-life balance issues in mind more than ever before. And employers are going to take this into account for recruitment and retention of their workforce. 85% of recruiters have seen candidates reject a job off because it would not be conducive to work-life issues. 
depend on me for support. I've missed many of my family's important events because of work time related pressures and responsibilities. I almost always bring work home with me. Okay, so that's the list. Count up your points. See how many you have. If you have zero to two, your life is in pretty good balance. And uh, you just gotta stay on guard and make sure it stays there. If you have a score between three and five, your work-life balance is teetering on the edge, and now is the time to make changes before the problems overwhelm you. If you have five or more, your life is out of balance, and you may need to take immediate action to make changes in your work before things start crashing around you. And don't you just love these internet things? <laughs> Actually, I scored nine on this. So.
And third, be explicit about the timeline to get the job done. Fourth, they need to know the bounds of their own empowerment and authority and versus the time when they need to come back to you so that they may know what their limits are. And uh, then it's important to get agreement uh, that they're going to do the job. There's nothing worse than delegating something to someone and finding out uh, several months later that they really never had any intention of doing what it was you wanted to do. Uh, and also, have an agreement about how often you'll touch base. What is the reporting arrangement and, and when, how often will they report back to you? Okay, so now we've decided what's important and where the voids are and we've prioritized our list. And we've decided what we can give away, what we, or first it's what we want to keep or do ourselves. And maybe we've even figured out that there's some things that we truly um, don't need to do at all for any reason. So we need to simplify and let those, those things go off our list completely and onto someone else's list. As you can see here, the goal is to work smarter, not work harder. Now, what do you do when other people who have learned to delegate try to put things on your list? Well, that's when you need to learn to use the N word. And uh, there's a book by Susan Newman called Getting to Know. And she offers some tips for those of us who may have trouble using First, be polite but direct. Don't worry about seeming nice or giving excuses or apologies. Just say no. If you start making excuses, people will start poking holes in your excuses and then eventually you'll end up saying yes. So don't try to be nice, just say no. Uh, second, avoid self-deprecation, such as saying, well, I'm really not the best qualified person for doing this because they'll start pouring on the flattery and pretty soon you'll feel as though you have to say yes. Third, uh, the requester may fall back to a smaller request if you say uh, no the first time. Don't say yes to even a tiny request because they'll be getting their foot in the door and the next thing you know, you'll be doing more and more. Another good approach is to say, I'll have to check my calendar and get back to you. That will give you a chance to get back to them on your terms and be able to decide, do I really want to do this? Can I do this? Or should I just say no? And then the most important thing, I think, is to remember when you say yes, you're saying no to something else. There's only so much time. So what if you've already decided what are your priorities, and this is not one of them, then maybe it's better to remember that and uh, keep the important things. Now, there are also things that we can do uh, to help with our power-ups. Sometimes, when we are at home, we're not really there. We're not mentally there. We have uh, uh, not present with our family. Sometimes we bring the office work home, either literally or figuratively, and continue to thread up our work issues. And I, I really, frankly, found that uh, up until, I, I have an empty nest now, but up until August, when I had my children still at home with me, it was wonderful to come home from the office and be forced to completely uh, change gears and to put a new hat on. I think it was a, a very helpful thing because then you had to let go of those problems, at least for a while, and enjoy the presence of the family and all that. So I think if you can just leave that behind, cut it off, and uh, enjoy what you've got for a few hours. It's a very helpful thing. <clears throat> um, you know, and even now that my children are gone, my husband deserves that same courtesy. So uh, it's an important thing to try to continue to do. And when my children were little, particularly, I enjoyed going on scheduled dates with my husband. We would have to plan it ahead, get the babysitter, and then we'd put them on the calendar pretty religiously once or twice a month so that we'd just get out, get away, days for a real vacation is important and don't take the work with you. Leave the laptop at home. One of the hardest things for me is to disconnect from my Blackberry. I must admit that's, that's hard, but truly uh, it doesn't take one or two emails to spoil a very good mood. So you almost waste your time if you do that. So if you can, do that for yourself. Leave it behind so that you're not uh, constantly being brought back into the work world while you're away. That can be pretty helpful. And we've all heard the phrase, take time to smell the roses. And that can mean different things to different people. For me, I need to hear the birds singing. I know that may sound 
silly, but there's something about that, just a half hour of being outside where I can really hear the birds singing and it, it's where it's quiet. I'm sure it lowers my blood pressure by 10 points immediately. Uh, if I don't go to the lake for a weekend, my heart practically stops because I suffer <laughs> that. Um, so whatever it is for you, make time for that so that you really do have a chance to get away. Now, the important thing to realize is that one size doesn't fit all. What works for me won't necessarily work for you. It's very, very personal, and uh, we, you need to be sure that if you have something that's working for you and it doesn't look like the next person's arrangement, you don't have to feel guilty about that. It's whatever works for you is important, and don't add guilt to everything else in this equation. Finally, I think we should expect that we'll move, that when we move into different phases of our lives, um, things will change. There are going to be, and I think this is well supported by the literature, there are episodic perturbations in your work-life balance. And there'll be stretches of time when things are very much going well, and then other times that things may be out of balance. And this may be from a family illness, or a new job, or a new baby, or a move. I've been dean now for a little over seven months at the College of Medicine, and I can promise you my life right now is not in balance. Now, a year ago, it was going pretty well, so I think it is going to be one of those things that takes a little bit of time. When I became department chair in pediatrics, it took about 18 months before I felt as though it wasn't uh, just an overwhelming time pressure. But then, it got on an even keel, and I felt as though it was manageable again. Uh, so I'm repeating that cycle now, and I'm not sure how long it's going to take, but I'm confident somewhere at the end of the tunnel there is going to be that life. Um, and, and so I think you can anticipate that and not feel as though if you are in a situation right now where there's something has happened, whether it's the job or at home, that, that has created a lot of stress, that it has to be that way forever. It doesn't. I think you can find that plateau and then move on forward. Um, most importantly, you need to keep your list of priorities and revisit it from time to time and update it uh, as things change. You have to be accountable to yourself and monitor how you're doing. You need to watch for signs of burnout in your situation. And uh, I'll just mention a few of these. Uh, emotional exhaustion, uh, low sense of accomplishment, and depersonalization relationships are all signs of burnout. And by depersonalization, I mean treating people as objects, where instead of having positive, energizing interactions with them, people just frustrate you and want to not have anything to do with them. And that, that would be a, a clear sign of burnout in almost any field. Contributing factors to that include situations where you have a low sense of control over your workload demands, where it's just coming at you from all sides any time of the day or night sometimes, and uh, you don't really have any control of that. Where you have poor social support, uh, your spouse or family members can be a very important source of stability for you. And also if you don't find meaning in your work, if you're not seeing that it is accomplishing something. Now positive strategies to avoid that are again spending time with family and friends, uh, religious activities, exercise, Having a positive attitude about what you're doing, and again, a, a supportive spouse or partner. All of these relate to good work-life balance and will contribute to psychological well-being. But more than that, happy employees make happy bosses and better bosses, and they themselves will treat customers better. So if there's a payoff for the employer as well as the employee if we find a way to uh, have everyone have some balance in their lives. I'm going to stop at this point and uh, see what questions you might have and, and more importantly, what other ideas you may want to contribute Thank you, Dr. Fodger. We really appreciate all those insights. And uh, let's see if I have any questions. Christine? Christine is one of our former students. And also, what 
you have in place for young families, maybe at UAMS, in terms of on-site daycare or flex time, or those types of things? Thank okay, you. sure. Uh, well, first, with regard to the Women's Caucus, uh, we started this in 1989 after I had the privilege of attending one of the Association of American Medical Colleges meetings as a women's liaison officer. They uh, asked each school in the country, each of the medical schools, to send to someone who can look at women's issues with the national group. And uh, after I got there and found out all of the wonderful things that were going on in other schools, I came back to uh, Don Wilson, who was our dean at the time, and uh, suggested that we might have a group where the women could have a chance to visit about certain issues uh, that they had in common, and it was specifically designed around a faculty development concept, so that we would have for the women uh, a, a more formalized network to allow people to mentor one another. Uh, it was there was really pretty good data to suggest both here and nationally that women in these professional positions and faculty positions uh, didn't seem to have as much access to more senior mentors as the men did in more informal networks. And so because there were fewer of us, uh, it seemed like a reasonable idea to try to gather them together and see what we could learn from other people. So we started that with a, brought in a guest speaker uh, and had a, the first of the professional development days that we have continued uh, up to this time, and now they include the men as well. So uh, everyone has access to these particular speakers that are coming in the workshops. Uh, I think it has been valuable in many ways, the mentoring programs that have continued uh, through that group, and, uh, which has taken on a life of its own with leadership from women in the school, is just terrific. Uh, I'm very proud of the things that they've accomplished. With regard to what's going on on campus, there is less, uh, I'm afraid. And in fact, I believe it's tomorrow morning, isn't it, Linda, that we have a, a consultant coming in to look at, uh, the, today and tomorrow, uh, to look at the possibility of what it would take to run a daycare operation for employees and faculty on campus. Uh, we don't have that right now. We did once upon a time, and for various reasons, that, preceded me, I don't have uh, really the inside information as to why that was shut down. I think it was financial. Uh, but we're going to be looking at the feasibility of trying to start something like that again, which would be a, a very valuable and supportive service for our employees. Any questions? We were talking about this right before the speech. Um, and we know an article that said that in the upcoming medical school class, uh, that only two African American students have been accepted. Can you talk about the recruitment uh, or the, the, the challenges of attracting minority students uh, in medical school? Yes. Uh, in the, as, let me just explain a little bit about the way our admissions process works. We have a process where all of the applicants are reviewed and considered by uh, our admissions committee. And then there is an initial group of people who are accepted. Um, the two you're referring to were in that initial group. And uh, then from that point forward, many of those students who are initially accepted will have been accepted by other schools as well and will decide not to come. And so we have an alternate list as well. There are other, uh, including other African Americans, on the alternate list. And so we don't yet know exactly how many are going to be in the, in, in the class. Uh, it will go up from where it is, I'm sure. But nonetheless, uh, we will start dropping down the alternate list and then add additional uh, students to the class. One of the problems that we have is having enough uh, well-qualified minority applicants to make it through that process. And uh, this year, uh, we found that the impact score were considerably different for that group and made it really hard for them to reach the threshold. We know that we know pretty much what the threshold is for students to be able to succeed in medical school just from past experience. And below a certain number is really tough uh, to, to be successful. Now at the same time, as I said, I just returned last night from uh, 
San Francisco where we went to the Association of American Medical Colleges Council on Dean's meeting. And I was, uh, I've, I've gotten to be good friends with the Dean of the uh, Historically Black uh, College at the Meharry. Uh, she's a, a wonderful woman and we were visiting about this very issue about how we can increase applicants. UAMS had 25 African American applicants for medical school this year. Meharry had 4,000 applicants for 96 positions. And I said, would you please share some of these people with us? How can we work out an arrangement that we might be able to uh, encourage more people to apply, apply here? How can we uh, possibly do something with them? And so uh, we, I had actually emailed back and forth with some of our uh, minority uh, recruiters here and I think what we're going to do, first of all, is to send a contingent to my area to find out a little bit about the processes and how they work and how they advertise. And, you know, part of it is people wanting to be in a situation in which they're comfortable. We know one of the things we have to do is to have more faculty uh, who are African American. And we have uh, hired some, but they're, we're still looking. And uh, we need to be able to recruit them and then gradually grow that system. So one of the, uh, we have an advisory committee made of uh, minority physicians in the community who uh, met with me, um, it's been about three weeks ago now, I think, and uh, we're working together with them on scholarships because that's another thing that is a limiting factor. We have other schools who are able to offer full rides for these students and kind of steal away our Arkansas students. We have many that go to Memphis where uh, they will provide a full ride for our Arkansas students, uh, for the minority students in medical school. And we need to be able to counter that. We don't have the scholarship funds to do it right this minute. So we've got all kinds of things like that that we're going to be trying to work on. And of course we have a new, our new uh, physician recruiter is a graduate of uh, one of your classes here. So we're looking forward to working with her on the plan. Uh, Sometimes be more demanding than the children, uh, but 
nonetheless, it's, uh, it is important to figure out how how you're going to partition your life and what can you do. Can you afford if you go into this new position? Would you be able to get good reliable health? And I will tell you this: that getting good reliable child care, what has been for me historically the most stressful thing of my entire professional career. And you know, I've had periods of time when they've been very good, and I've had other times when it's been turnover, 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 and just really frustrating. And, you know, that's something that we, you know, don't start. Uh, if you have those kind of problems, don't start feeling you know, like it's just you because I think that. A lot of people experience that kind of thing, but um, again, it's a, a good investment. So if you can, if you're going to be in a position where you feel like you can get good, reliable childcare, then uh, yes, I think it's a, it's, it, it definitely is worth the trade-offs in the long run. But you got to be able to get up with it. You wouldn't be able to do it by yourself. Question. Dr. Um, I have a question about residency programs. Usually. Uh, in a time when uh, women are trying to start their families and have their children, and I was wondering if the programs in general are doing anything to become more family friendly, and uh, especially when it comes to child care that you mentioned. That, uh, I'm just asking because I've heard how difficult sometimes it is for a new resident to get a spot in a child care in, in a children's hospital. Right. Yeah, they always have a waiting list there. I know, they're wrong. Right? <laughs> uh, but I think that uh, what we would love to be able to provide those kind of child care options on the UNS campus. As I said, today and tomorrow we have our consultant here to help us look at this and uh, to see if it can be done feasibly uh, for financial reasons and nothing else. I think that the demand is there and I think it would be a wonderful thing to have available. Uh, individual programs are able to provide some flexibility for um, women who are having families during their residencies, and those can be worked out. There are certain guidelines that they have to work within because the boards that accredit them uh, will have certain guidelines, so that they have only a limited amount of latitude, but they can do what they can to try to make that work. We have time for one and a half uh, this is something from experience, you know, um, I had my first shot as a second year resident, you know, this is my second, my third you know, our second was my first year fellowship, and then, you know, I got pregnant again last year from fellowship, and I did a pretty good fellowship. And I'm not sure that there, I, I mean, I wasn't asking anybody to cut the staff for I because I was pregnant, but my experience was that people just would not even take that into account of being pregnant, you know, they're making you run on the stairs, I had my babies, Prematurely, and it wasn't just me. All my fellow residents were having their babies early, and, but uh, and I went to this meeting that they had talked about this problem, you know, having uh, babies early and all that. But there was just nothing built into the program, even to you know, not even let you have a call. You would be on call and contracting <coughs> out of pain. No, seriously, and my friends went into labor during being on call and all that. So I thought that was totally unfair. Um, you know, I was trying to save all my vacation because. There is no additional vacation as a term of vacation. You have to save your vacation to be off to you know, have your child. And I thought that was just going to be unfair to females, you know, who were actually trying to do their best. Um, and is there anything in discussion? I've been to national meetings, you know, where they have talked about it and in women's meetings, but is there anything that's coming out or well, I'll be honest with you, I'm not aware of anything national that's coming out. I think that what we are finding is that we are able to work with different programs to try to help them uh, create a little bit more of a family-friendly environment. And frankly, it's in the program's best interest to do that because when they don't, then they can alienate half of their potential applicants uh, who would be women. So it's, it's an important thing. Um, and I can certainly relate to the things that you mentioned. I was actually on call uh, when I went into labor myself <laughs> with my child, so I've been there. There is not a systemic fix to that for the training programs at the moment. I think on the faculty side, there have been some uh, advances where we've uh, like, arranged now in our promotion and tenure documents to have an extra year for people who have had more pregnancies to 
be able to achieve tenure, so that is less penalizing than it once was. Uh, we also have non-tenure pathways that allow for people who uh, would perhaps prefer not to have that clock ticking uh, to continue their progress, but, but we're not, we haven't solved all those problems. Thank you, Mr. President, for uh, sharing your experience in life with us. It's certainly very enlightening. As a monthly pediatrician and a leading profession in your field, how much would you say a child would benefit in the early years from having a full time mom versus being put in the daycare? And uh, I certainly don't mean to discount the role of the father, but if uh, we're putting the family first, how much flexibility are we affording the couple to spend time with the family in the monster? There is, uh, uh, I think, let me answer your first one first. Uh, the question about uh, having a full-time mom, there's actually quite a lot of uh, data out there about child developmental outcomes when they have uh, a daycare experience versus just being uh, at home with a mom. And there are some differences between the children, but as it's, it's interesting, the uh, uh, ones who are actually in a daycare experience sometimes are prove to be more adaptable kids and are more socialized, more verbal, things like that. So that some of the outcomes are actually very positive. There really aren't any terribly negative things about having uh, a child who has a daycare environment, presuming it is a quality one. And that's the thing that we have to make sure about, that our children uh, that are out there are in a very quality environment. Um, the other thing is that with regard to the uh, dads, uh, the same rules apply for uh, leave to moms as well as dads in this situation. So that if there is a, uh, a situation where the dad needs to be off because of the birth of a child, uh, there is the opportunity to provide uh, some extra time as well. So. Dr. Pfizer, thank you very much for uh, sharing all this test with us. Uh, I want to ask you later about how you might negotiate delegating to each other. Never try to take too long. So anyway, let's all get back to five